Hey guys, Peter Franson here from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. Uh, well, back in June, we had uh, a, a developer, a, a, well, I was going to say a well-known developer, but a developer of a well-known game, Five Nights at Freddy's, um, who was met with some controversy and then stepped down from being the head of uh, development on Five Nights at Freddy's. Uh, and then more recently, John Gibson, the CEO of Tripwire Interactive, uh, most well-known for their Killing Floor games, and more recently the Maneater open world shark game, uh, has stepped down because of a controversial tweet that he put out there. And I wanted to uh, take a little bit of time to just uh, retrace these, uh, these events and some of the details surrounding them and then kind of uh, look at the idea of us as Christians figuring out how to navigate the current climate in social media and cancel culture and things like that. So um, this is really just going to be a temperature check on these things. I'm not looking to analyze these two situations and like, okay, wh what could these guys have done better? And, you know, how were they also mistreated and da 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 I mean, there's plenty of noise going on about that on both of these stories all over the internet. That's not really my intent here is to like figure out who was in the right and who was in the wrong and in what ways people were right or wrong. Uh, I just want to put these situations out there as examples of what kinds of things can happen when certain conditions are met and when people say certain things or when certain things are revealed about them in the current climate and then make some comments on uh, you know how maybe we can learn to to navigate social media and the current climate well as believers so first off uh, I'm gonna share a little bit of this article over at gamesindustry.biz uh, which in part said recent reports shared open secrets record of Cawthon's past donations. This is Scott Cawthon, the uh, creator of Five Nights at Freddy's. Uh, his donations amounting to over 30, 36,000, the vast majority of which has been given to Republican candidates, including divisive figures such as former President Donald Trump. These sparked a public backlash against the developer, prompting a statement on a now-locked thread of the FNAF subreddit. Uh, Cawthon wrote, I'd like to think that the last... Seven, actually, you know what? I'm going to go to his full statement here over on this Reddit and uh, just read it in its entirety. Um... So Scott Cawthon says, this message isn't, it's titled, My Response and Maybe Last Post. This message isn't specifically, direct, specifically directly at the Fredit community. This is just the community that I care about the most and where I choose to post these things. I never cared much for Twitter anyway. To say that the last few days have been surreal would be an understatement. I've debated greatly how best to address this, including not addressing it at all. But with so many people from the LGBT community in the fan base that I love, that's not an option. I'd like to think that the last seven years would have given me the benefit of the doubt in regards to how I try to treat people, but there I was, trending on Twitter for being a homophobe, getting doxxed with people threatening to come to my house. My wife is six weeks pregnant, and she spent last night in fear because of what was being said online. She has already been struggling with her pregnancy, so seeing her so afraid really scared me. All this because I exercised my right and my duty as an American citizen to vote for and support the candidates who I felt could best run the country for everyone. And that's something that I won't apologize for. For those who took the time to look, you saw that the candidates I supported included men, women, white people, black people, Republicans, and Democrats. I supported Kimberly Clackick, sorry, I'm going to butcher these names, in Baltimore because I believed that she really cared for the African American community there and wanted to pull them out of poverty. I believed she could have really made a difference in a time when so many black communities were struggling. She lost, unfortunately. I supported Tulsi Gabbard, a Democrat, even though I disagreed with her on several several issues because I felt she would have been a good and fair president. And yes, I supported President Trump because I felt he was the best man to fuel a strong economy and stand up to America's enemies abroad, of which there are many. Even if there were candidates who had better things to say to the LGBT community directly and bigger promises to make, I believed that their stances on other issues would have ended up doing much greater harm to those communities than good. All of this explanation, I fear, is wasted, as people don't want to discuss with one another anymore. They want endless apologies and submission. People who are expecting those from me will get neither. I've always been supportive of creators and have tried to treat everyone fairly and treat everyone with dignity and respect. I've never cared about anyone's race, religion, gender, or orientation. I just treat people as people 
everyone the same. And because of that, I've ended up with a very diverse group of people that I've worked with over the years. It wasn't intentional, it just happened that way. I choose people who are best for the job, I treat everyone the same, and I ended up with people from all walks of life in my professional life and my personal life as well. That's the way it should be. That's the way I want it to be. That's the way I will continue to be. I'm a Republican. I'm a Christian. I'm pro-life. I believe in God. I also believe in equality and in science and in common sense. Despite what some may say, all of those things can go together. That's not an apology or promise to change. It's the way it's always been. If I get canceled, then I get canceled. I don't do this for the money anymore. I do it because I enjoy it. If people think I'm doing more harm than good now, then maybe it's better that I get canceled and retire. I would accept that. I've had a fulfilling career. Besides, most things that people can take from you are things that never mu had much value to begin with. I have always loved and will continue to love this community and this fan base, even if someday it doesn't include me anymore. Uh, the uh, gamesindustry.biz article uh, went on to kind of point to another statement that Cawthon made uh, in which he said, I've been shown tremendous love and support over this last week, a lot of which has come from the LGBT community, LGBTQ community. The article goes on to say, looking forward, Cawthon said uh, he will be handing the reins of the FNAF franchise to, quote, someone of my choosing and someone that I trust end quote, while he focuses on more personal projects. Quote, now I'm approaching my mid-40s. I realize that I miss a lot of things that I got to focus on before FNAF became such a success, unquote, he wrote. Quote, I miss making games for my kids. I miss doing it just for fun, and I miss making RPGs, even though I stink at it, end quote. He concluded, quote, I only ask that my fan base respect my decision. I will still be around, just not in the capacity that I used to be, end quote. So uh, whether this counts as cancellation or not, I'm not really interested in talking about the definition of cancel culture or what it means to be canceled or whatever, but because of uh, the um, backlash, the reaction of uh, many people on social media after um, his, this, these donations that he made kind of came to light, um, he uh, was led to make the choice to, to step down um, out of uh, concern, at least in partly for, uh, it sounds like, his, his wife and his family um, and just where he was giving his time. Uh, okay, so now moving to the, this more recent situation with John Gibson, who, although he, he doesn't mention it in this tweet, is a Christian. Um, if you play the Killing Floor games, you are very likely listening to uh, Christian death metal. <laughs> that those games use in their soundtracks. Um, and uh, so anyway, and so he's been outspoken as a Christian for a number of years. And on September 4th, Gibson on his personal uh, Twitter account, not his work account or anything representing uh, his uh, Tripwire Interactive, but on his personal Twitter account, uh, tweeted out, proud of U.S. Supreme Court affirming the Texas law banning abortion for babies with a heartbeat. As an entertainer, I don't get political often. Yet with so many vocal peers on the other side of this issue, I felt it was important to go on the record as a pro-life game developer. Um, so this is another instance where it would seem that uh, his, uh, I mean, he's talking about something political, and, and the, the Scott Cawthon was, you know, also uh, uh, getting negative reactions for political alliances and stuff, but I think it's probably safe to say with both of these guys that um, their political uh, leanings were the result of how they view the convictions of their faith and what their uh, their faith is leading them to conclude they ought to do uh, as far as their participation in government. Um, and so anyway, yeah, again, he says, proud of U.S. Supreme Court affirming the Texas law banning abortion for babies with a heartbeat. As an entertainer, I don't get political often, yet with so many vocal peers on the other side of this issue, I felt it was important to go on the record as a pro-life game developer. Uh, now, that was September 4th, and then on September 5th, Shipwright Studios, who has published uh, through uh, Tripwire Interactive, of which John Gibson was the CEO, um... They uh, replied to his tweet by saying, while your politics are your own, the moment you make them a matter of public discourse, you entangle all of those working for and with you. Uh, I thought that was an interesting and broad statement. 
Um, we have worked closely alongside the talented and passionate developers at Tripwire and your partners for the last three plus years. We know it is difficult for employees to speak up or act out in these scenarios, and they may not feel comfortable to speak their minds. It is regrettable, but we feel it would be doing ourselves, your employees, your partners, and the industry as a whole a disservice to allow this pattern to continue without comment. We started Shipwright with the idea that it was finally time to put our money where our mouth is. We cannot in good conscience continue to work with Tripwire under the current leadership structure. We will begin the cancellation of our existing contracts effective immediately. So this was their response uh, in their relationship with Tripwire. Uh, this, this was their action uh, responding to the tweet made by John Gibson on his, uh, on his personal Twitter account. Um, anyway, yeah, very, uh, very, uh, very interesting stuff there. Um, Again, I think of note is this uh, opening statement, the moment you make your politics a matter of public discourse, you entangle all of those working for and with you. Um, you know, I do wonder if the same thing would be said uh, of someone at the head of a studio making uh, left-leaning political comments. Um, I, don't know that, uh, I don't know that it would, but in any case, that is how this is perceived, and I think that's important for us as Christians to take note of. Is it right? Is it wrong? That's, I'm not really talking about that at this point, but I'm, we're doing a temperature check on how the world is operating right now. And I think this is an important thing to take note of, that this is where the world is at right now. Um, then Torn Banner Studios on September 5th, also a studio that has published through Tripwire, said, We do not share the opinion expressed in a recent tweet by the president of Tripwire, publisher of Chivalry 2. This perspective is not shared by our team, nor is it reflected in the games we create. The statement stands in opposition to what we believe about women's rights. Uh, now, I don't believe they took any steps to cancel their contracts, uh, but they were, uh, you know, just kind of like differentiating their position from John Gibson's position. Now, looking back over here at John Gibson's tweet again, you know, he said, I felt it was important to go on the record as a pro-life game developer. I mean, you could look at that and, and wonder, well, was he saying that, that Tripwire is a is a pro-life game developer i mean i can see someone maybe assuming that or mistakenly interpreting it that way i don't think that is the most sensible interpretation of the text here but i can see someone maybe misunderstanding his intent there um and you know there's also the the, the issue of the, the the law itself um i'm not very familiar with this law but i know that it's a very controversial one um with some things added into it that incentivize in, incentivize um, people to report those who are breaking the law with like a, a large sum of money that they can get for reporting somebody. And so there are elements of this law that I think even those who support the pro-life position would say, uh, I'm pro-life, but there's some things in the mix here that I do not approve of, you know. So this is a contentious, controversial law that has, uh, that has been passed. Uh, and so I think that is worth noting as well, how much of this is the law that's, um, that's making John Gibson's uh, tweets here distasteful to a number of people, and how much is it his mere, merely his pro-life position? How much is it maybe misunderstanding him representing only himself versus Tripwire Interactive. Uh, there's there's a lot of kind of like potential messiness in this tweet here, um, and so th that makes it hard to know what people exactly are reacting to. Uh, but anyway, yeah, as I said, uh, Torn Banner put out a tweet uh, kind of distinguishing themselves from John Gibson's position, uh, and that was on September 5th. And then we have, on September 6th, Tripwire themselves released a statement titled Tripwire appoints interim CEO Alan Wilson as company moves forward. And they write, the comments given by John Gibson are of his own opinion and do not reflect those of Tripwire Interactive as a company. His comments disregarded the values of our whole team. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, as uh, it was uh, Colin Moriarty on uh, Last Stand Media pointed out in reacting to this, he wondered if really that could be true of all the people there, would really no one else uh, 
share the same values as John Gibson. I thought that was an interesting comment. Anyway, his comments disregarded the values of our whole team, our partners, and much of our broader community. Our leadership team at Tripwire are deeply sorry and are unified in our commitment to take swift action and to foster a more positive environment. That's the phrase that stuck out to me in this. We'll come back to that. Effective immediately, John Gibson has stepped down as CEO of Tripwire Interactive. Co-founding member and current Vice President Alan Wilson will take over as interim CEO. Alan has been with the company since its formation in 2005 and is an active lead in both the studio's business and developmental affairs. Alan will work with the rest of the Tripwire leadership team to take steps with employees and partners to address their concerns, including executing a company-wide town hall meeting and promoting open dialogue with Tripwire leadership and all employees. His understanding of both the company's culture and the creative vision of our games will carry the team through this transition with full support from the other Tripwire leaders. Uh, but yeah, I want to come back to this this thing here um, that they're our leadership team at Tripwire are deeply sorry and are unified in our commitment to take swift action and to foster a more positive environment. And so that made me think, well, huh, what's the negative thing that they feel needs to be corrected? All that we have to go on is this tweet here. And so if if they're reacting to something else that is not uh, that was not made public here, then I've missed it, and I wish that they would clarify what the negative thing is. Uh, in the absence of any clarification about what the negative thing is that they would want to counteract with a more positive environment at Tripwire, I am led to assume that the negative thing is included in this tweet from John Gibson, who again tweeted, proud of U.S. Supreme Court affirming the Texas law banning abortion for babies with a heartbeat. As an entertainer, I don't get political often, yet with so many vocal peers on the other side of this issue, I felt it was important to go on the record as a pro-life game developer. Um, that doesn't strike me as having a particularly negative tone. Uh, of course, uh, the the bill, the, the law was very controversial, and so perhaps that is the negative thing that is being talked about. I don't know how that Texas law would be affecting the environment of Tripwire so that it is a, a negative environment that they feel they need to make more positive. Um, but nevertheless, this is the statement that Tripwire made seemingly in response to John Gibson's tweet. And so again, I think that's an important temperature check to just kind of see this is how people are going to tend to react to these types of statements and these types of medium and stuff like that. So uh, let's see here. And then on September 8th, John Gibson, uh, having stepped down, tweeted out uh, a statement here. He says, by now you have heard of my exit as CEO of Tripwire Interactive. To the many fans, friends, and peers across the belief spectrum that have reached out to offer care and support, thank you. It means more than you can imagine. For those upset about my exit, I encourage you to continue your support of Tripwire and their many amazing partners. Please know that the owners and executive team of Tripwire have acted with class, professionalism, and have treated me well with great care and dignity, and I will be forever grateful for this. It has been one of my greatest pleasures in life to serve and lead the ex Excellent team at Tripwire, yet a team is more than just a leader. Its heart and soul are the many great people that execute the vision and turn it into reality. I am confident that the many incredibly talented and passionate individuals at Tripwire will continue on to achieve even greater things. I know what is coming next from this team and the world will be blown away when it arrives. To the many great partners we've collaborated with over the years, I would like to say thank you for bringing your best to the table and working through many challenges to succeed together. From those that gave us our start via the MS mod competition to great digital distribution platforms providing us a platform to bring our games to the players, we would not have been able to get off the ground without you. More recently, it was inspiring to see an amazing team's craftsmanship and drive to create the best medieval slasher possible. Behind the scenes, excellent contractors enabled Tripwire to go further, faster than we would have been able to alone. I wish all of these partners the best success now and in the future, John Gibson. So that's the lay of the land. Again, I'm not here to analyze these situations and determine points of fault and innocence. Um, all we have are these short bits of text communicated in various ways, and there are complex people, lives, and situations behind all of this. I think everyone involved, you know, is, is human, and so everyone involved is bringing some degree of their sin into the mix. And it's really easy and tempting for us to position ourselves as these sort of righteous, casual armchair judges. I don't want to add to that noise again. You can find that elsewhere, certainly. Uh, instead, I want to use these situations again as a temperature check for the way the world is right now, and then ask, 
how can we navigate social media and other types of communication in this kind of cultural climate in a way that will make us effective as Christians? Um, and as I was kind of looking through scripture and trying to find verses and passages that would be relevant to this question and trying to figure out, you know, an answer of some kind to this question, I, 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 I saw them gravitating toward four principles that seemed to kind of come out to me. And so uh, I'm going to go through these four principles and some scripture related to each of them. Uh, the first principle is that time, place, and medium are key. Just because something is true does not mean now is the, time, the right time or the right way to say it. Uh, now, bear with me. I have more scripture for this one than the other three. Um, this will take me just a little bit longer. But Proverbs 25, 20, whoever sings a song to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. One that's maybe a little more relatable to us as modern uh, readers. Proverbs 27, 14, whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing uh, to the person presumably that's waking up and doesn't want to hear that. So you got to read the room before you put your feelings and your thoughts out there. Consider how they will be received. Um, Proverbs 10, 19, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. Whoever restrains his lips is prudent. So the more words we have coming out of us, the greater the chances are that we are going to end up sinning, sinning in the process. Proverbs 12, 18, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So when words are rash, they're not thought through, we just put them out there. Um, they can really end up being like sword thrusts. But if we are wise and shape our words based on wisdom, then we bring healing into people's lives and, and, and situations. Proverbs 13, 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Now, it's certainly true that believers can uh, lose their lives, can come to ruin um, when they don't say anything. But it is a principle of life that if we, the more we guard our mouths, the more we preserve our lives from a whole bunch of danger and trouble. And the more we open our mouths wide, uh, the more likely we are to come to ruin. Proverbs 21, 23, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Uh, I think that speaks for itself. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Again, I think that speaks for itself. Proverbs 16, 23, and 24, the heart of the wise makes his speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to his lips. So he's not merely content to just say what's on his mind, but has an eye toward being thoughtful and persuasive. How can I persuade with my words instead of merely making my words heard? Uh, verse 24 goes on, gracious words, and again, grace is undeserved favor. So delivering words that are a blessing that the hearers of those words do not deserve. We might say, well, I'm just going to tell them what they deserve to hear. Well, that's not grace. Grace is what people don't deserve. It's blessing them. It's favoring them in a way that they don't deserve. So words that are favorable in a way the hearers do not deserve are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. So we can bring life, restoration, healing into our interactions with others if, we, if our words are, are better than what they deserve. Proverbs 17, 27, and 28, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit, as opposed to a hot spirit, is a man of understanding. Even a fool, I love this, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. So uh, is, uh, the best course of action, I mean, if you're just serving your own pride, and that's not what this verse is advocating, it's just making an observation. You know, if a person wants to come across as, in, as intelligent, well, maybe speak less. <laughs> uh, Proverbs 18.2, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. I wish this verse was the default, like, faded text that's in a field that you can type into on, like, Twitter or Facebook. You know how usually it just says, like, type here, say something, or whatever. I wish instead it said, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his his opinion, just so everyone would stop for a second, maybe, before they start typing. Um, Proverbs 22, 11, this is the last verse here. He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious, remember the definition of grace, 
We'll have the king as his friend. If we want to have a voice, an influential voice, which certainly someone who has the king as their friend or the president as their friend, that's an influential voice. If you want a voice like that in people's lives, then develop purity in your heart and develop speech that is a blessing and is favorable in a way that is undeserved by those who receive that speech. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that Jesus, just talking about uh, time, place, medium, um, really key stuff, Jesus withheld information about himself until a certain time in his ministry. Um, all truth is not the appropriate truth to say right now. And Jesus demonstrated that in his ministry. Paul, the apostle, met his unbelieving audience where they were at. He was quoting their poets and not unloading everything about God that's true all at once. We see that in Acts 17, 28, meeting people where they're at. John closed two letters expressing a preference for face-to-face -face dialogue on certain subjects. Second John Chapter 1, verse 12, though I have much to write to you, I would prefer rather, I, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. Similarly, 3 John, verses 13 and 14, I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. Um, and when determining the communication platform for our words, it's worth remembering even social media platforms intended for Christians are almost always still accessible and viewed by non-Christians. Or that could apply to any other people group. If you are a Republican or a Democrat and you want to say something really passionate about vaccines or masks or whatever, be aware that almost certainly your words will be intercepted by those who have a very different view from you and maybe very passionately have a very different view from you. We should always assume that the people we don't think will read our words will in fact read them. Um, and I found that out the hard way <laughs> in the past. Um, so again, the first principle, and it's the one I promise I'm spending the most time on, time, place, and medium are key. Just because something is true does not mean now is the right time or the right way to say it. Second principle, we can't operate with the expectation that we will be treated fairly. This world is not our home and we are not entitled to feel like it is. That doesn't mean that anger is never appropriate, but I think most times when we get angry because of the way that we're treated as believers, it's because we're kind of shocked and like, oh, that I, I, mean, I was expecting something different. I have the right, I have this right and that right because I'm an American or blah, 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 or whatever, you know? Um, but first and foremost, our identity is as Christians, those adopted into God's family and his kingdom is not currently of this world. It is on its way, but it is not, it is not fully here right now. And so, so we shouldn't expect to be experiencing life in God's kingdom in its fullness right now. This world is not our home. We are not entitled to feel like it is. And so with sobriety, we should just react and say, yeah, okay, man, that was a, that's a hard thing that I got to deal with right now. And it's just one more way that, that I'm reminded this is not my home. First John chapter three, verse 13 says, do not be surprised brothers that the world hates you. John 15 verses 18 through 21, Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12 Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. That's going on all over social media right now, uttering all kinds of evil against believers falsely. Um, but is it on Jesus' account? That's the question. Rejoice and be glad, he goes on to say, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So again, before we get to that idea of whether or not we're being persecuted on, on the account of Christ or not, the, the principle here is we can't operate with the expectation that we will be treated fairly. This world is not our home. We are not entitled to feel like it is. Uh, the third principle, which 
jumps off of that last one. We have to avoid letting the expectation of mistreatment justify our self-made martyrdom. We must be persecuted only for Christ-like qualities, not for creating unnecessary conflict. Uh, it's easy to be insensitive in speaking truth and then falsely attribute the negative reaction we receive to the truth we expressed rather than the sinful and insensitive timing or method with which we expressed it that is really maybe the greater cause of the negative reaction we're getting. Yes, we are blessed when persecuted for Jesus' sake, but we are not blessed for being abrasive Christians. Proverbs 18.6 says, A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. There's just a way that our foolishness can put us into fights that didn't have to happen just because we're approaching things foolishly. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 9, Jesus said, and this is actually right before he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Right before he said that, you know, he said this, Blessed are the peacemakers. So we shouldn't just, because we know we're going to get persecuted for righteousness sake, just lean into that, lean into, you know, uh, giving ourselves over to persecution, uh, just like throwing caution to the wind. No, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Sons of God. If we want to be known and recognized as the adopted children of God that we are, we need to be skilled at bringing peace to situations instead of conflict. First Peter Chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Okay, let's come back to that idea of meddler. Thayer's Greek lexicon entry regarding the word meddler here uh, says one who takes the supervision of affairs pertaining to others and in no wise to himself. A meddler in other men's matters. And it goes on to say of its use in 1 Peter 4.15, that the writer seems to refer to those who, with holy but intemperate zeal, meddle with the affairs of Gentiles, whether public or private, civil or sacred, in order to make them conform to the Christian standard. Now, while we can and should peacefully participate in our governments when permitted, and while we can and should model the characteristics of Jesus in our lives, which in itself will inspire some, some non-believers and convict other non-believers, um, it's not our role as believers to try and get non-Christians to behave like Christians are supposed to behave. When clarifying his instructions, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? So again, this third principle, we have to avoid letting the expectation of mistreatment justify our self-made martyrdom. We must be persecuted only for Christ-like qualities, not for creating unnecessary conflict. And the fourth and final principle that stuck out to me, when sharing our thoughts in person or through social media, we need to speak with genuine love and avoid being noisy gongs. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, so these amazing words, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So what does that love look like? Because um, we don't want... The words of truth that we feel convicted to express to just be a noisy gong. We want them to be heard, to be considered. So what does love look like? Uh, I think that we, the, the definition of love, both among non-believers and believers, is not meditated and, and pondered enough. I think that our relationships would look so different if we spent more time pondering what love is as defined by God through the Holy Spirit in these words here, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love, here's some, uh, some definitions, some, some descriptive elements. Um, love is patient. I mean, this is one of those passages, by the way, that you could do word studies on and just spend weeks studying words in this passage and developing, uh, accumulating this rich definition of love. Love is patient. We could 
stop there. Stop on any of these. I won't. Patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And a few that, that in the context of communication on social media that really stand out to me, a uh, few words, patient and kind. Man, if we just make sure before we start typing, patient, am I being patient and kind? Not arrogant or rude. Is this going to come across as rude? Am I being sensitive here to how this might come across? It does not insist on its own way. That's kind of like that angry feelings of entitlement that I mentioned earlier. We don't want to have that. It's, it is not irritable or resentful. Gosh, those all by themselves could stop us from saying so many things that just come across as noisy gongs and clanging cymbals on social media. If just before we start typing, take, you know, just te take a temperature check of ourselves. Am I fearing, feeling irritated right now? Am I feeling resentful right now? Okay, well then if I am either one of those, let me just not type this. And let me just wait until that time, if it ever comes, that I can be devoid of irritation and resentment in my heart. And that may mean, if we make that our filter, that we just, some things we never get around to typing on social media or commenting on in social media, and that's okay. That's okay, because it's just gonna be a clanging cymbal and a noisy gong anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, that's hugely challenging verse right there. So again, this fourth principle, when sharing our thoughts in person or through social media, we need to speak with genuine love, really arrive at a place where we genuinely feel compassion and love and concern um, and feel just broken, maybe, maybe feel genuine sadness for the person that currently is making us angry or irritated. Um, that, that takes time, that maybe days, maybe weeks, maybe we never get there, you know. But that's where we're meant to arrive at. We need to speak with genuine love so that we can avoid being noisy gongs. Um, so again, the, these four principles more succinctly stated. The first one, time, place, and medium are key. The second, don't be shocked at unfair treatment. The third, be persecuted only for Christ-like qualities. And fourth, don't be a noisy gong. Speak with love. These are, these are, I was going to see, say these are hard. These are impossible. You know, there's, there are many times where I'm just like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I think we just need to prepare our hearts for repentance in all of these things. Um, repent to God and then repent um, in the presence of those that we have maybe been, been rash with. Um, just have a willingness to say, you know what? I do have this view. I, I express it horribly. I can only imagine how it might have hurt you or come across. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And uh, I think the more we rely on the identity that we have in Christ, the more able we will be to make those kinds of apologies. This is really, really hard stuff, and we are going to fail at it. Um, but, uh, well, let me just say this, Lord, meet us where we're at in our brokenness. We're just so easily caught up in how the world operates, and we don't want to be. We want to be different. So make us more and more to be like the children you've envisioned us to be and uh, protect people from us and uh, set us apart for your purposes, God. Help us to have love and compassion. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Hey guys, Christian Geek Central is launching our Game Save event for the first time this year and I would love for you to be a part of the 2021 Game Save team. As a member of the team, you will be raising funds for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital throughout October by telling friends, family members, or co-workers about your fundraising, and if you like, doing some kind of game-related event, like a game night at your home or church, or like me, you can do a crazy 24-hour video game marathon. 
As your team leader, I'll provide tips and resources to make your fundraising as fun, easy, and effective as possible. For more information about the event or how to sign up, check out the links to some helpful videos below. You can also leave a comment or uh, email me at P-A-E-T-E-R at spiritblade.com with any questions. I cannot wait to get this started. I would love for you to join me. Thanks.